Okay, everyone, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> I'm getting deja vu. Um, book of Job. We're going to do the book of Job. Um, I feel that this book is timely. I've given you guys, and I know Curtis has given some pretty hard messages recently. Uh, and quite often these hard messages can kind of sometimes leave us in a place of feeling about this big and not knowing what to do and, you know, bordering on into self-condemnation. And that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, so let's look at the example of Job. We know the story quite well. We think we know it quite well. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's one of these stories that we think we know, and then you reread it, and things just start jumping out, and you're like, wow, I, I never saw that before. Because the, the age-old question is, what did Job do wrong? We know he was a righteous man. Elohim called him a righteous man. Um, so what did he do? Why would Elohim, like, who, who chose for Job to go through what he did? It was Yah, it was Yah that offered him up. Have you considered my servant Job? So why would, he, why would Elohim do that to a righteous man? He's obviously keeping Torah, you know? So, I'm going to, like the story of Samson, when we did the story of Samson, we went through the teaching and some of you probably see Samson in a bit of a different light now. Right, we, as children, we grow up thinking he was this hero, and you read the story, and you're like, ah, oh, that's not so good. For a judge of Israel, he was meant to be a savior. He was actually meant to be a typology of Messiah. Um, but we, see, we read Samson's line, life, mistake after mistake. Now, Job isn't so much in the same way of Samson, but as I was rereading through it, I was like, I, I finally really started to understand why Job was sifted the way he was. Now, because we're going to kind of look at Job in maybe a slightly different way by the end of the series, we need to understand what Elohim thought of him. Um, so, Ezekiel 14, son of man. When a land sins against me to commit a trespass and I shall stretch out my hand against it and cut off its supply from bread and send scarcity of food on it and cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Eov, Eov is the Hebrew for Job, even though these three men were in it, they would only deliver themselves by their righteousness, declares the Master Yah. Now, this is not speaking salvation, okay, of eternal life. This is speaking about being protected from, uh, not so much exile, but from death. Ezekiel 14 and most of the book of Ezekiel is Yah pronouncing judgment on the house of Judah and also on the house of Israel, but primarily Judah. And if through, in the book of Ezekiel, we see the prophecy of impending exile and then we actually see the exile occur within Ezekiel's life. Yah saying that only Noah, Daniel and Job would be saved through that, through the onslaught of Babylon. If they were present, the rest of Judah, gone. So Yah holds him up to a high regard. In fact, he even repeats himself. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and I shall pour out my wrath on it in blood to cut, it, cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel and Eov were in it, as I live, declares the master Yah, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. So not even their children would be spared. They would only deliver their own lives by their righteousness. So Elohim holds these three guys in high regard, like very high regard, to the, po to the point he will repeat it. Now, th when things are repeated hebraically, it's take heed, take note. So as I said, we're, we're going to uncover some of really the heart of Job and what was going on under the surface in his spirit and in his, at the heart level. But despite all of that, remember, Yah holds Job to a very high regard, a very high regard. And again, remember, even though Elohim held Job to such a high regard, he offered him up to Satan twice, twice, not once, twice. Why? 
So who was Job? There's not a lot in scripture, but we can kind of piece together a bit here, a bit there. There's little clues here and there. Uh, And when we pull these little clues together, we can build a a better picture of Job as opposed to, oh, well, he was just a guy and he's shrouded in mystery. Job 1, there was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Eov, or Job. And that man was perfect and straight, and one who feared Elohim and turned aside from evil. So it's a similar description given to John the Baptist's father, actually. He was blameless. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. And his possessions were 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys and a very large body of servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Okay, So this is someone, this isn't like a, a low class person, shall we say. Like, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. This is someone who's wealthy. He's very great. Uh, He's obviously done very well for himself, extremely well. You would probably say along the lines of Abraham. Abraham was very rich for the day, very rich. So what we do know about Job, uh, he's in the east um, and very righteous, very great. Job says some interesting things about himself. Now, remember, Job did not sin with his lips. We're we're told this twice in the book, uh, which means that he speaks truth. Um, We're going to see an interesting thing with that in the later parts. But Job says some interesting things. Job 29, 7, when I went out to the gate by the city to take my seat in the open square, what does this mean to those of you who understand Eastern culture? He was, yes, he sat with the elders. He would have been a judge. To take my, when you went to bring your cases before the judges, it was in the open square so that you always had multiple witnesses. Job is telling you he was an elder of the city. He's telling you he was a judge, a wise man. And in fact, as we keep going, the young men saw me and hid. The aged rose up, they stood. Now, Torah will tell you to rise before the aged. And Job is saying that the aged rose before him. So this is someone held in very high esteem by the wise men. Rulers held back their words and laid a hand on their mouth. The voice of leaders was hushed and their tongue clung to the roof of their mouth. To me they listened and they waited and kept silence at my counsel. So this is a very wise man, okay? After my words, they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them. So Job was held, he he was so wise that once he spoke, mic drop. You didn't need anything else after Job had spoken. And they waited for me like the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. So here he's telling you they were seeking him out, actually, I smiled at those who did not believe, and the light of my face they did not dim. I chose the way for them, and sat as chief, and I dwelt like a sovereign in the army, like one who comforts mourners. He's telling you he passed judgment. I chose the way for them. He gave wise counsel. Who knew that about Job? Very wise man. Again, we read right over these things. But for him to be sat in the open square, and again, is Job lying? No. We know that he was a righteous man. We know he didn't sin with his mouth. So he's not bluffing us here. He's being truthful here. And we're going to see this, that this is part of Job's, look, I did all the, you know, like I was righteous. Essentially, what's going on, Father? What's going on? I've been faithful to you. Why is all this happening to me, right? We've been there, haven't we? Who here has uh, had this moment? We come into the faith and things start happening and we go, but I keep the Torah, Father. Why am I getting curses? Who's had that moment, right? I, and I, I have, I've had people write this into me, you know, I'm, I'm keeping the commands as best as I can. And yeah, I'm still having all of this. Speak to Job. Speak to Job. He was blameless, blameless. And yet he went through what he went through. But 
as we can see, he was a judge. Anyway, let's keep going. The name Job, Eov, means hated or persecuted. A very fitting name. Uh, it comes from the root word below it, Ayav, which means to hate or to be hostile towards two. So clearly in the name is this idea that he felt he was, uh, it was hostility was being brought to him. Uh, and in fact, you will read, and we will read in the later parts, that Job knew where this was coming from. He knew it was coming from Elohim. And he says, he's essentially saying, yeah, like, I've been righteous. I've done these things. Why are you allowing all this stuff to happen to me? Which is a fair question to ask. Now, there's a really interesting line of thought, and I think it holds a lot of merit, Okay. Um, we can't say 100% for sure, but there's very strong evidence. This line of thinking is that Job is Jobab, or Yovav, the son of Bela. Okay? Now, if you're wondering, who on earth is this guy? In first, he, he shows up in Genesis, and he shows up in Chronicles. These were the sovereigns who reigned in the land of Edom. Now, where is Edom in comparison to Israel? southeast now job was great in the east okay in the land of eden before any sovereign ruled over the children of israel so this is before the kings like david and so forth Belar, son of beor and the name of his city was din hava now who else is has beor as a father balaam oh if um Jobab is the son of Bela, you have a choice. Either Balaam is his uncle, or there's a possibility it could have been his father. Let's keep going. Uh, here it says, uh, Numbers 22.5, he sent messengers to Bilam, son of Beor. So if Job is Jobab, that means he's a relative of um, Balaam. Okay. Now, if you look at the Hebrew, the top one says Bilam, son of Beor. Bilam ben Beor. If you look at the one below it, Bela ben Beor. The only difference is the final mem. Let me bring up the mouse. Right here, there's a mem here that's missing on Bela. That's literally the only difference. So is there a contraction going on? And it's quite common for people to have their names changed, isn't there? Abraham. Sarah, and when you look at name changes, it's usually one letter. So, is there a link here? I find it interesting to say the least. But let's keep going. And when Bela died, Yovav or Jobab in English, son of Zerah of Botzcha, reigned in his place. Now, we know that Job says he sat at the gates. He sat at the gates and he was very wise. He was considered eldership at the very least. So here we see him, if this is the same character, him reigning in the east, which is interesting. And Yovav died and Husham of the land of the Tamanites reigned in his place. Now bear in mind this thing of the Tamanites being involved or nearby, because this comes up. Now... Essentially, Zerah, so Yovav, son of Zerah, he was of the lineage of Esau and dwelt in Bozrah. He was part of the family, the extended family, shall we say. Now, Ishmael and Esau gets a bit of a bad rap in the movement. And we, because we, we read certain scriptures and essentially we label all of them like because of a couple of bad apples or because one person had a snapshot in their life where things didn't go so great. But we forget they're still part of the family. Okay, they're, they're part of the family of Abraham. This is a genealogy of Abraham. Let's get the mouse across. So there's Abraham, Isaac, Esau here. Now Esau had three wives here, and this is the wife, gave birth to Reuel, and Reuel gave birth to Zerah, and Zerah would have given birth to Jobab, okay? So he's about four or five generations from Abraham. Now, who else, who else is called Reuel? 
Moses' father-in-law, Yitro, Jethro. Are they the same? Where did Jethro live? In Midian. Where's Midian near? All the lands that Esau and so... I'm, you've got to remember that back then, people were having children very young and living quite long, over 100 years. So it's quite easy for there to have been three or four generations alive at the same time. There's only four generations between Levi uh, and Moshe. People don't realize that. Now, if you're having kids at like 15 to 20 and you're popping them out, you know, fairly frequently, it's very, you can see how there could be some crossovers. I just find that interesting. I'm not saying it's definite. I just find it interesting uh, that this could have been a lot closer to home than what people realize. Um, let's keep going. Now, this makes a lot of sense when you consider who Job's three friends were. We know of his three friends. Forewarning, as we go through the book of Job, you're gonna realize I don't want friends like that, uh, but we'll save that for later. His first friend is Eliphaz the Temanite. Now the Temanites came from the grandson of Esau. You have Esau, you have Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, and from that you have Teman. And Teman became a region. He was, uh, he was one of the chiefs, in fact, let's bring it back up, right here in the bottom left, there's Taman. So you've got Esau through a different wife, Eliphaz and Taman, okay? Now, when you understand that Job had a friend who was a Temanite, who here has heard that Job is possibly pre-flood? Anyone ever heard that? This proves it wrong. Eliphaz the Temanite, Taman was not around before the flood because Taman was the grandson of Esau. So you're actually in the period of time, probably not too far the ex, well, a bit before the Exodus, but it's in that time of um, Jacob and the 12 brothers growing up. The, the, and maybe a couple of generations down. It's all in that time period if Eliphaz is from Taman. Interestingly, the Septuagint says that Eliphaz was the king of the Temanites, which is interesting. Now, that makes sense when you understand um, Esau's family tree. The second friend is Bildad the Shuchite. Now, Shuach was who the Shuites came from. He was the son of Abraham through Keturah. So Keturah was his concubine and he had sons with Keturah after Sarah died, okay? This is after Sarah and Hagar. And if you read Abraham's, when he had sons, he would have a son and then send them away so they wouldn't have competition with Isaac. Um, now, he, Abraham was having children with Keturah a lot later in life. A lot later. So again, for Bildad the Shuite to be around, right, there, there needs to be Shuites, is the point I'm trying to say. Again, this is after Abraham. After Abraham. His second friend is so far the Naamathites. Now, Naamah is actually a town in the lowlands of Judah. It's in the lowlands. So again, or just from Job's three friends, you know that the event had to be after the flood and actually after Abraham and Isaac. It has to be in that third generation below for it to make sense. Now, what's really interesting, the Septuagint, it point blank actually says this. Um, in the Septuagint, this is the very last verse of Job. Now, in the, in the Masoretic, it was saying, Job died an old man full of days, and it stops there. Now, in the Septuagint, you get about eight more verses. Now, I will say this. Personally, I think it is a later edition, but it makes sense. Like, even without the Septuagint, which we're going to about to read, you can still make the point that I've just made, if that makes sense. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to what they're saying. It is written that he shall rise again with the ones whom the Lord shall raise up. Now, that if you re we'll read this, but Job knew that he would be redeemed from Sheol. 
This man is described by the Syriac book as dwelling in the land of Uz, on the borders of Edom and Arabia, and his name before was Jobab. It point blank says it. Now, the reason I think this is an addition let by the Septuagint writers is because the prose is different. Who knows what prose is? The way the language is written. Like, it, it suddenly feels different. Um, and having taken an Arabian wife, so again, this is within Ishmael. This is Ishmael and Esau. He fathered a son whose name was uh, a son whose name was Inan, and he himself has a father, Zerah. Again, pointing back to the lineage of Esau from the sons of Esau, and his mother was Bosara, and that made him fifth from Abraham. So again, he's he's part of the family. And these were the kings who were ruling in Edom, which territory he also, he himself ruled. Now this makes sense because Job said he was a judge. He was sat at the gates. He, he was a ruler. Ruling in Edom, which territory? Uh, first, Bilar, son of Beor. Now in other places, Bilar is interchanged with Balaam, in, depending on what manuscript you're looking at. So if Job is Jobab, Balaam is either his father or his uncle. Now, was Balaam a true prophet? Yes. yes. But he was a prophet for hire. He had greed problems. He, had, he wanted to be wealthy. He was a true prophet, though. He heard from Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where did Job learn righteousness, right? Um... After that, Bilal, Jobab, who was called Job. And after this, Husham, who was serving as a leader from the territories of Thaman. And after this, Hadad, son of Bered, who was destroyed Midian in the field of Moab. And the name of his city was Avith. Um, and the friends who came to him were Eliphaz, the sons of Esau, king of the Temanites. It actually says he was the king. So that was Esau's uh, son. I've, I've forgotten the, the family tree already. Uh, Bildad, the tyrant of the Shuhites, calls him a tyrant. And Zophar, king of the Naamathites. And it says this at the beginning. When, when the three friends first come onto the scene, they, um, it says this in the Septuagint, again, that they were the kings of these regions. So again, it would make sense, Job being a ruler, for him to have other friends who were rulers. Um, now remember what I said that, um, oh, oh, it's gone, never mind. Does that make sense? Now, scholars will debate. Is it this? Is it true? For me, I like looking at the Septuagint and saying they're a lot closer to the source text. The Septuagint is estimated was written about 200 BC. They're, to me, they're a lot closer to the source material. And even if you were to take the Septuagint factor out of it, you can make that, you can make that link through the scriptures, just through the, uh, through the names and through the family trees. Anyway, the Septuagint is just saying it point blank. Um, now, what's interesting, the Septuagint said that his name was changed from Jobab to Job. What's interesting is that Jobab in the Hebrew or Yovav means howler. Now, does that fit the story of Job? Job sat there, you know, in pain and going, what's going on? I think it's very fitting. Howler. Comes from the word yevav, to bawl or to cry shrilly. Now, this word yevav is only used once in scripture. Um, and this is in Judges 5.28. This is the song of Deborah when they've conquered Sisera. And she's speaking about this in the song. Through the window of the mother of Sisera look and cried out through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay to come? So this is a woman mourning for her son. And this is how this word is used. So Job, howler, how do the nations in the east mourn? A lot of noise. They howl, they shriek, they, they do, lot, you know, and they get professional mourners in, so in some places. So it seems to fit. So instead of, a, think of howling as being in a state of mourning, okay? So again, I just find this all very, it seems to fit. It seems to jive. 
Okay, and very quickly, we're not. The structure is important because we. I'm still not sure whether we're going to read every single verse. If we do, we're going to be here for weeks and weeks and weeks. So it's probably going to get condensed down. I want to take the main points out. So just so you understand the structure, Job 1, Job's possessions and children are taken away, right? We have the scene with the divine counsel and so forth. Job 2, Job's health is taken from him. This is where all the boils come out. And this is when his three friends come to comfort him. In Job 3, Job laments his life. Why was I born? You know, this whole thing. Now, Job 4 to 28 is a back and forth. You have Eliphaz reproves Job, Job responds. Bildad reproves Job, Job responds to Bildad. And then Sophar reproves Job, and Job responds to Sophar. Now, this happens three times in these chapters. However, on the third time, there's no reproof from Sophar. Okay, does that make sense? So it's, it's, you get this back and forth going around the circle. Job 29 to 31 is Job's final discourse. So he, just, he gets it all out and there's, there's some really interesting things in there. Uh, this is where Job says, by the way, that he's, um, that he's a judge, basically. It was in that little section. Now, Job 32 to 37, this young chap called Elihu appears on the scene, seemingly out of nowhere, and he reproves everybody. Everyone gets reproved. And Elihu is a very interesting character. The things he says, uh, they show a lot about him by the words that come out his mouth. And I was reading Elihu's speech, and I was like, my goodness. Um, But we'll get to that later. There's some gems in what he says. Um, and then Job 38 to 41 Elohim responds to Job puts him in his place right asks him a lot of uh, questions um, that Job cannot answer and finally Job 42 Job responds to Elohim Job intercedes for Eliphaz, Bildad and so far and Job's life is restored to a double portion actually to a double portion So, this is just introduction. Um, Let's start. Job 1. (laughs) There was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Eov, and that man was perfect and straight, one who feared Elohim and turned aside from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So, back then, children, like if you had lots of children, it was considered a blessing. And his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large body of servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons went and had a feast in the house of each on his day, and sent and invited their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it came to be when the days of feasting had gone around that Eov would would send and set them apart and he would rise early in the morning and offer ascending offerings, the number of them all, for Eov said, it might be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. This Eov or Job always did. Now we see Job acting as an intercessor here, okay? But I want you to notice... He was the one setting them apart, and he, why was he doing this? He was, this is going to come up later on, and this is something I want to mention, actually. I should have mentioned this at the start. We're going to make some statements today that may sound a bit bold, and then we're going to go through the book of Job to quantify those statements, and then at the end of the teaching, I want to circle right back to these statements. Does that make sense? Who... Biblically, who sets who apart? Yah sets us apart. Can you see a little thing here? Job is trying to set his children apart. He's trying. Bear in mind that, but by the way the language is speaking, these are adults. Okay, his children are now adults for them to be able to feast and stuff. To me, biblically, that means they're accountable for their own actions. And I believe this is going to become something that Job is tested on, okay? First of all, we know what happened to his children, don't we? Elohim took them. Job, no matter what you do, 
They're in my hands. You cannot save them. You cannot protect them. Right there, off the offset. Now, this will become very clear when we see the things that Elohim was testing in Job's heart. Uh, I know it sounds like a bold statement, but bear with me over the next few weeks. And the day came to be that the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yah, and Satan was also came among them. So this is clearly speaking in the heavenlies. And Yah said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered Yah and said, from diligently searching in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And Yah said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim and turns aside from evil. So Elohim's not lying. Job is a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim. He turns aside from evil. Now, being perfect and straight and fearing Elohim and turning aside from evil, is this more of a spiritual leaning or a physical leaning? Oh, silence. I'll leave that question open. It will start to answer itself. Satan answered Yah and said, Is Job fearing Elohim for naught? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. So Job was untouchable. The enemy had not even considered him. Because he knew he couldn't access him. This is critical in understanding in the realm of spiritual warfare. Elohim was the one that put Job up for, to be sifted. Okay? This is critical to understand. But stretch your hand out, please, and strike all that he has if he would not curse you to your face. You stretch your hand out, Satan is saying to Elohim. Yah said to Satan, see, all that he has is in your hand. So the authority has been now being given to the adversary to sift Job. Only do not lay a hand on himself. Now, I want to bring this up, and this is a bold statement. It's going to ruffle some feathers. Either Elohim has allowed you to be sifted, or you have given legal right to the adversary to do so. If anything bad is... Like, and I mean like spiritual, like actual oppression, actual misfortune, not like, you know, bad luck, you know, because life does happen. You can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, the, I've put here, if it's not under the covering of Elohim, it's actually fair game for the adversary to play with. This is why Job couldn't be touched physically, because he was, he feared Elohim, he was righteous now, I've had people say, but Michael, I'm trying to keep the Torah and I'm trying to keep his ways and I'm trying to keep his covenant. And you may well be. I mean, Job did at the highest level. He was perfect and blameless. But disobedience can happen on the heart level. And last time I checked scripturally, we're going in for a heart judgment. Elohim, like what's meant to be uh, written on our hearts, his covenant and we, we, we underestimate the power of, or the influence of our fallen state over what we do and how we think. So we have to understand Elohim is on the throne. Like if you're experiencing genuine, like genuine bad stuff and oppression and things, I'm not talking about you've made from bad some bad decisions and now you're re recouping the, 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 you're reaping what you've sowed. Because that happens a lot. That's called blessings and curses. Either Elohim's allowed it, or you've given legal right to the enemy to do so. It's, 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 there's no in-between on this. To make this point even clearer, 1 Kings 22. This is another divine council scene. Then he said, so this is Micaiah or Micaiahu. He's been brought before the king and the kings are saying, should we go against Ahab? And the king says, speak the truth to us. And he says, guys, I've seen Israel scattered. You're going to lose. And anyway, then he, the prophet said, therefore hear the word of Yah. I saw Yah sitting on his throne, all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And Yah said, who shall entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramot Gilad? And this one said this and another said that. 
And his spirit came forward and stood before Yah and said, let me entice him. And Yah said to him, in what way? And he said, I shall go out and be a spirit of falsehood in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, entice him and also prevail. Go out and do so. These are the prophets of the, two, of the kings. Elohim allowed it. In fact, you're seeing this divine council kind of scene going on. And now see, Yah has put a spirit of falsehood in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And Yah has spoken evil concerning you. Yah's on the throne. Yah allowed the prophets to be deluded. Sounds a bit like Thessalonians, doesn't it? That Yah sends a working of delusion. Now look at the reaction to this. Sidkiyahu, Zedekiah, son of Kenana, came near and struck Mikayahu on the cheek and said, where did the spirit of Yah pass over from me to speak to you? He didn't like what he'd been told. He didn't like it. Telling people why they endure certain things doesn't bring about the best of reactions, as I have found out. With the statement I made prior, if stuff's actually happening to you, like on a spiritual level, Yah's allowed it, or you've given ground to the enemy. There's, scripturally, there's no other way. And people get offended. But it's the devil's fault. It's the devil's fault. <sighs> if it's not of Yah, it's fair game for the adversary to, to have fun with. And again, we have to remember that we've fallen not only at the physical level, but at the emotional uh, soul level. Our emotions, the heart is fallen. Right? So, and I believe this is what was going on with Job. Job in the flesh was blameless. He kept the commands. He was wise. He, but I believe, I'm going to make this statement, I believe there were things in his heart that needed to be worked out. And this is why, and because of his righteousness, that's why the sifting had to be so great, to really bring it to the surface. Bold statement, I know. We'll make our way through the book. Romans 12, I call upon you therefore brothers through the compassion of Elohim to present your bodies a living offering set apart, well pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now Hebraically, the mind and the heart are one, right? So that our heart is where his covenant is meant to be written on. So this renewal of the mind, the spirit working in us, so that you prove what is the good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. For I say, through the favor which is being given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he should think, but to think soberly as Elohim has given to each a measure of belief. Notice Paul's talking about the renewing of the mind or the, trans the heart transformation. This is being linked to being haughty. Now, did Job know he was righteous? Oh, he goes on about it quite a bit. He does. He knew he was righteous. Look, look, it, again, like, that doesn't mean he was arrogant. Like, sometimes fact is just fact, right? Like, like I've said in the past that true biblical humility brings about boldness because of what he is doing all, in all of us, right? Is this thing when people, like, they'll steal his glory by saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm this and I'm that. And it's like, be open. He's done a work in you. Yes, you're not a finished product, but he's done a work in you. He's doing a work in you. Now, I bring this verse up because a lot of people, a lot of what people call spiritual oppression actually comes from a mind and heart that hasn't been renewed. People think they're being oppressed in the mind, and they're saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm being demonically oppressed. A lot of it is actually from your EAD, emotionally arrested development, bad thinking, and a mind and a heart that's not being renewed. Like, again, we really underestimate the power of the fallen. You, you know how you've seen people, they sit there and they work themselves up. Like, it's like they want to be depressed or they want to be sad. They want the EAD. EA, now, EAD comes from multitude of things trauma it can come from the society we live in like look at what the world is ra wanting our children to be raised up in take away the authority structure of the family nucleus you're getting a load of children that can't hold down a job because they can't respect authority that's just one form of it 
But a lot of what people call spiritual oppression is actually self-inflicted. Or I don't want to say self-inflicted like they're to blame, but we're a product of the environment we've been raised in. And our environment is lawless, it's sinful, and we're at the tail end of the degeneracy of man. Don't tell me that hasn't affected the way we think. Yes, it has. Now, if you've got these issues where, you know, psychological, mental, or just character issues, and they're not, of, they're not right, they're not submitted, does that give the enemy a right to play with, to wreak havoc? Yes. But the enemy's only working with what's already in you. Yeshua couldn't be... This is why Yeshua overcame. He was fully submitted. There was nothing the enemy could play with. To, for, for. Does that make sense? I know it's a really bold statement, but I, this thinking, unfortunately, shifts the responsibility for us to take repentance seriously. That is actually a process. And again, this statement will make more sense as we go through Job. And in fact, we've got a really good example of it today with Job's wife. Something again we read right over. The heart is crooked above all, right? We're desperately sick. We quote this all the time. Who shall know it? Do you actually believe that? The heart is your mind, your soul, your emotions. Jeremiah is saying it's desperately sick. That's why it needs to be renewed. I, Yah, search the heart. I try the kidneys. We're in trouble then. And give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And I believe this is what was going on with Job. His heart was being searched and exposed. In Hebraic thinking, again, the heart is the mind and the essence of man. We would say it's the mind and the soul. It's where your emotions are. It's where, this is why, you know, the battleground of the mind. Curtis and I use this phrase a lot. Because this is where the battle was won or lost. And it's actually where spiritual warfare begins. Like I've done a whole part on this. Uh, it's the final part of spiritual warfare. Again, we quote this verse all the time, but we, we don't actually understand this. If you're saying, oh, well, the devil made me do it, you don't understand this verse. You actually, like, you may know it up here, but you don't walk it, if that makes sense. It's, it's not become living. People underestimate, and they truly underestimate the effects of the fallen nature. They really do. We are desperately sick. And we do things like it's beyond our control. And I don't want to say that that gives us carte blanche, like a, 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 you know, go do what you want. But our flesh does things in the background we're not even aware of. Again, very good example at the end of today. Genesis 8, 21. This is after the flood. Noah's offered up the offering. Yah smelled the soothing fragrance. Yah said in his heart, never again shall I curse the ground because of man, although the inclination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. This is where Judaism gets the idea of the evil inclination and the good inclination. For out of the heart comes forth wicked reasonings. This is your king speaking. Murders, adulteries, whoring, thefts, false witnessing, slanders. These defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Things in the physical, right? Now, David takes it one step further. See, I was brought forth in crookedness. Born in it. He was born in it. And my, in sin, my mother conceived me. He says, even at conception, I was born into a fallen state. Now listen to what he says. See, you have desired truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you make me know wisdom. That's Elohim's desire, that the truth, his ways, his covenant, go to the inward parts that they're not just physical three-dimensional deeds and works, but it's actually written on our heart. And I'm going to make a statement here. There was hypocrisy in Job's heart, and he wasn't even aware of it, which means there was a lack of truth. Not that you... That, not like an absence of the knowledge of it, but again, his fallen nature was coming through. Because when you read it, like he says one thing and then a few chapters later, he actually says the opposite. And it's like, well, which is it, Job? Which is it? 
Paul says because the mind of the flesh. Notice he doesn't say the body of the flesh. The mind of the flesh. Now Hebraically, mind, heart, same thing. The mind of the flesh is an enmity towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able, and those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. Again, this is why we need renewing the mind. Now, look, I'm going down this little rabbit trail because, again, why do things happen to us? Elohim, like, either we've given ground for the enemy to wreak havoc, or Elohim is allowing something to be, to be brought to the surface. And to be sifted, he has to use the adversary. 2 Corinthians 10, For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim, for overthrowing strongholds, for overthrowing reasonings. Reasonings start in the mind. Now, Paul is talking about the mind of the flesh. The mind needs to be renewed. So the heart needs to be renewed. David says, Yah wants truth in the inward parts. And every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim. So pride. Taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Messiah. Again, the mind. Or the heart, Hebraically. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Spiritual warfare all begins here. The problem is, like I said earlier, we are a product of the society that we've been brought up in. Which means we have the odds stacked against us. People are broken. People have EAD. Let's work that out first before we start pointing the finger at the enemy. Now, can the enemy use that? Yes, but it's in you. The enemy didn't put it in you. So again, why is this happening to Job? As I said, something is going to be brought to the surface. Anyway, and the day came to be when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brothers, the firstborn. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding alongside them, when Shiva fell upon them and took them away. So Shiva is a nation. And they struck the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, literally like one after the other, another also came up and said, The fire of Elohim fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to inform you. Now, notice they're saying the fire of Elohim fell from the heavens. Did, who did Elohim send to or allow for this to happen to Job? Satan, the adversary. But notice they're still saying it's the fire of Elohim. They understood that Elohim must have allowed this. Now I find this very interesting. Why? The book of Revelation talks about fire coming down from heaven. They worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. So the enemy is giving authority to the beast. But where did the enemy get the authority from? Yeah. From Yah. Who is like the beast? Who is able to fight him? He was given a mouth speaking great blasphemies and great matters and great blasphemies. And he was given authority. Like again, the authority is always given to do so for 42 months. Again, this goes back to this idea that it's Yah who raises up and topples kings. Like Yah allowed our current world system to be where it's at. He allowed it. Doesn't mean he enjoys it. In fact, I'd say he doesn't at all. But he allowed it. And it was given to him, again, given to him authority to fight with the set apart ones and to overcome them. Elohim's allowing this. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. And I saw another beast come up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. So same authority in his presence causes the earth and all those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great signs so that he even makes fire come down from the heaven and on the earth before men. I see a very striking parallel between this and the story of Job. Jo Yah said, Satan, go do what you must, but you cannot touch him. And then we read later on that fire came from Elohim. And we see in a parallel here. Remember that authority has to be granted from the throne, even to the adversarial position. 
And I believe that we're seeing a parallel here. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. But again, where does he get the authority from? From up above. With all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness and those perishing because they did not love the, receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. Now, what did David say? That Elohim wishes the truth to be in the inward parts in the inward parts. And he says that right off the bat of, I'm born in a fallen state. In fact, I'm conceived in a fallen state. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood. In order that all should be judged, did not believe the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. I bring this up because Elohim allows. He has to allow. You've got to realize, like, I don't know about you, but it's quite a mean feat to call fire down from heaven. I can't do it. Which means the authority has to come from somewhere, is the point I'm trying to say. Yah's allowing certain things. Why? For his purposes. Now, before people may jump to the conclusion of saying, well, Michael, you're saying, it sounds to me like you're saying Elohim tempts people and does this and he entices people. Yaakov says something very different, or James. Let no one say when he is enticed, I am enticed by Elohim. For Elohim is not enticed by evil matters and he entices no one. But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. So going back to what I said earlier, there's only two reasons why if you're being oppressed or you're experiencing a spiritual problems, Yah has allowed it to bring something to the surface like he did with Job, or you've given legal right. And here you'll be deception, there's being this temptation. Look, it's not a temptation if it's not in you. Right? It's not a temptation if it's not in you. The enemy's only playing on what's in you. And this is why we need a renewing of the mind and the, and the heart. So we change from the inside of the cup. And this is the problem. We focus on the outside of the cup so much and negate the, the inside of it. Then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. Do not go astray, my brothers. <laughs> I love how he says that, do not go astray, and this can be linked to deception, being led astray, which means that the deception, people fall to deception because of something in them. This is why... You may have heard myself or Curtis say this. In fact, I guarantee you've heard it. But when leaven is brought to the surface, spiritual leaven, you need to get rid of it and deal with it. Because if not, you're going to go back to it. But this makes you more susceptible to spiritual deception, the more leaven you have. Why? Because there's something inside of us. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. He leads the world astray. So link that to James. James says that we're led astray, we're enticed by what's inside of us. Which means that the enemy leading the world astray, he's only exposing what's in them. Which is why Elohim's even allowing it. He was thrown to the earth and his messengers were thrown out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, now have come the deliverance and the power and the reign of our Elohim and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers who accused them before our Elohim day and night has been thrown down. Is this what Elo, uh, Satan did with Job? Did he accuse him? He accused him twice. Which is interesting. The deception is only possible because of what's in the heart of man, which is why I believe Elohim's allowing it to even it be exposed. Remember that this is about Elohim wants an eternal reign of people living with him. Something needs to be exposed before he brings it into eternity. 
And your, your, your flesh, your body's not going to make it because flesh and blood does not inherit, which means there's something inside of you that's, you know, your soul, your spirit. Well, that needs, you know, that needs to be exposed. Think of the great tribulation like the sifting of Job at the highest level, on a global level. This is why Yah even allows it. Anyway, rabbit trail over. Let's bring it back to Job. <laughs> While he was still speaking, so this is the third servant now come in. Another also came and said the Kazdim formed three bands. By the way, the Kazdim are Babylonians or the precursor to Babylonia. So this is another reason you know this is after the flood. And made a raid on the camels and took them away and they struck the servant with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And see, a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to inform you. Like, this is all within the space of one message. Like, they're all coming in at the same time. It was all at once. Now, because of this, look, no one has such bad luck. I'm sorry. You can't have that much happen to you just like that. Job's trials were clearly supernatural in origin. Clearly. Now, why do I say this? Again, not all trials that we go through of supernatural origin, a lot are self-inflicted. And I, I, I should probably say as well, not necessarily, so, some are. We make bad decisions and then we reap the consequences of those bad decisions. And some of them consequences can be far-reaching, okay? Look, drug addiction. No one, it, generally people don't force you into that. You get uh, sucked into it. But also, I, I, I want to add that a lot of the curses we experience or troubles are because we are a product of a fallen, dying world. And we're right at the tail end, which means, like I said earlier, the odds are stacked against us. We, we've got a lot to work through. But again, blessings and curses. If you, I like to bring up uh, divorce and adultery as a really obvious example because it's not like you're zapping people. Like if you have a married couple with children and one of the spouses commits adultery and ends up going with someone else, what's the curses of that? Well, the children suffer. This is how the sin go down to the third and fourth generation. It's not like he, there's some kind of magic thing. Like it's just the effects of sin. A lot of it we reap what we sow. It's just because people say, oh, I'm being oppressed. And it's like, well, I can trace it back to something in your mind generally or something you did. And I can generally do it quite quickly. Job, it was without a shadow of a doubt. It, boom, he lost everything just like that. I mean, fire came down from heaven. Look, I know this is, might be a bit harsh, but I speak from experience, okay? I've had, one of the biggest things I've had to overcome is realizing that a lot of the things I did, I either caused or instigated or, or uh, put fuel on the fire to something that was already going on. And that, the minute I started to re really go back and go my, and started taking responsibility, well, guess what? I started to overcome certain things. So look, I'm not saying this to beat people on the head. I am guilty of this. This is how I know. <laughs> this is how I know. Then Job rose up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and did obeisance. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I returned there. Yah has given, Yah has taken away. He knows where it's all coming from. Blessed be the name of Yah. Right now, Job is saying, I don't get it, but Yah knows best. Blessed be his name. In all of this, Job did not sin or ascribe wrongdoing unto Elohim. So, so far, he's doing all right, old Job. Hey, spiritually, not physically. 
Let's keep going. Again came to be the day that the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yah. Satan also came among them to present himself before Yah. And Yah said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered Yah and said, from diligently searching in the earth and walking up and down in it. And Yah said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So again, it's Yah, second time offering Job up. Job not done. Why would Yah allow this a second time? And as I said, I believe there was something deeply rooted in Job's heart that needed to come. And because of how deeply rooted it was, it was it's going to need a great fire to bring it to the surface. There is none like him on earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim, turns aside from evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, again, this is really important because the Adventists are very guilty of this. Bad things are happening to you, therefore you must be in sin. And if we can't see your sin, it must be something really bad that you're keeping secret, right? Man, I've, I've witnessed this really, you know, Job didn't do anything wrong. So when we see people go through, like, because you've got to think, like, in the Eastern mindset, like, he would have been considered cursed. Fire came from Elohim and burnt up his possessions. And Elohim saying he didn't do anything wrong. So before we start pointing the finger or throwing people in the lake of fire in our minds, right? Satan answered Yah, skin for skin, and all that a man has he would give for his life. But stretch out your hand, please, and strike his bone and his flesh, if he would not curse you to your faith. There's the accuser of the brethren. Yah said to Satan, see, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So again, the, the, the enemy is subservient to the throne. Satan went out from the presence of Yah and struck Job with the loathsome swords from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shirt with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now, Job 2.9, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity, curse Elohim and die? Even his wife knows where this is coming from. Or who's allowing it? But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Indeed, should we accept only the good from Elohim and not accept the evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So again, like, we have to remember that the, the lips speak from the overflow of the heart. So Job's got a pretty good heart on it. But we're going to see later on that there's a, a hypocrisy there. Now, I was having a really interesting discussion with my wife yesterday, and we asked this question, why didn't Elohim take Job's wife? He took everything. The possessions, the sheep, the oxen, the children, everything gone, apart from the wife. I find that interesting trial is a wife does a wife bring comfort well there she's not let's be honest but we'll get to that because it's not so black and white she's that. that's interesting you say that it's my next point who's being tested now <laughs> is it just Job being tested his wife is being tested now we're only this is the only time Job's wife comes up and there's a whole other time span all around this we don't know if Job's wife was providing him comfort in that time we don't actually know sure she's having a moment but we're only getting this tiny little snapshot why do I say this Job's wife would have suffered too she's watching all this happen to her husband he's gone from one of the greatest men in the land wham and if the two are one flesh Look, wives, do you want to see this happen to your husbands? Would this grieve you greatly? She lost her children. Yeah. And she lost her children. She lost her children. Exactly. In fact, I should have met, uh, mentioned this, but verse 9 in the Septuagint, the wife says a few more things in the Septuagint. 
uh, there's like an extra three sections and one of them is that she lost her children. She says that and that she lost the house and they're having to go back and forth. But Job's wife would have been suffering too, watching this happen to her husband, knowing he was a righteous man. Now, this made me realise truly how desperately sick our hearts are. We know the end of the story, don't we? That he came out, he was double portion inheritance, double portion blessing, Yah blessed him even more. And we, we know that trials refine you. So obviously a work was done in Job and we're going to see that. Job's wife would prefer for Job to die and not go through the crushing so that she didn't have to suffer. Curse Elohim and die. You've got to realize that not only was Job honor and shame, guys, you're in an honor and shame culture. The fire of Elohim has taken everything away you're now in a state of shame. The wife is in that same state. Okay? Now the wife wants, is there pride? Is there, you know, do I not want to go through this shame? Maybe, probably. But there's also the thing of she's having to watch her husband suffer. She's watching him suffer. And that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt. Especially on a woman being more emotionally geared. Job's wife would prefer he didn't go through the refinement so that she didn't have to suffer. And she's not thinking that. That's just... When I said earlier, we underestimate the power of the fallen flesh, the fallen state, our wicked hearts. Just as so she doesn't suffer, I will... You die and don't get the crushing and the oil that comes from it. This is, so this is why I say, you know, when people say, oh, the enemy is oppressing me, da, 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 you under, check your heart first. Check your heart. Because I believe this is what Job's wife was going through. She's being tested just as much as Job. We forget that side of it. But she would rather he died and not go through the overcoming so that she didn't suffer. How about that for a wicked heart? Guess what? We're all capable of it. It's all in us. This is why I say sometimes we do things and like we don't even know why we do certain things. Anyway, let's start wrapping up. We read that Job was a perfect man and straight, one who feared out of him turned aside from evil. So his actions are without reproof, right? His deeds. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So now he doesn't sin with his mouth. So why go through all of this? What is there left that he could possibly need refining on? As he didn't sin indeed, he didn't sin with lips. What's left to be tried and tested? His heart. It's the only reason why, and we're going to see this come through as, like, um, as we go through this series there's a clue to this, like we read this. His sons went and had a feast. Now, what does he do after the feast? He would send them, he would send them, set them apart. He would rise early in the morning and offer ascending offerings. Why? It might be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. There's a, I, I believe there's a hint here he can save his children, even though they're grown up. Yes, we should intercede for people, but... You reap what you sow, right? Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 18, the man who sins will die. And the son will not be held accountable for the father's sin. And the son will not gain from the father's righteousness. He has to have his own righteousness. How much was Job trying to protect and, and you know, smothering? Not smothering, but do you see what I'm trying to get at? So what does Elohim do? Okay, they're coming back home. Uh, you know, home, that's what I mean. And I believe there's a clue there. And we start, we'll see more and more of these when uh, we go through. Was there something at the heart level that was still inside of Job? And I've already made mention, yes. We're going to see fear we're going to see hypocrisy we're going to see him being sat on the throne of his life did it require the severity of the fire that job went through for it to be brought to the surface i believe yes 
Because he was right, he, he was very righteous. Yah holds him up as an example, right? He holds him up above people. So, you know, to really drill down, really drill down and bring that stuff up, he's going to need a serious fire. So serious that the first round didn't do the job. The first round didn't do the job. And in fact, the second one didn't do the job. It was in this discoursing that you see where the, it comes and it takes Elihu, the young chap, and Yah to show up to do the final job. And three of his friends heard Job, all of his evil that came on him, and each one from his own place. Eliphaz the Tamanai, Bildad the Shuhai, so far the Naamathai, and they met together to come and sympathize with him and comfort him. That's what friends are supposed to do. Right? And they lifted up their eyes from a distance and did not recognize him. And they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward the heavens. Then they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him for they saw that the pain was very great. So they were there to comfort him. Now, Job's going through the crushing. And his friends seemingly being nice to him it was in rereading job i realized my goodness you guys are jerks <laughs> but is there a parallel i believe there's another parallel yeshua when he's in the garden of gethsemane he says to the peter james and john his three closest notice the parallel person going through crushing three close friends my being my soul is exceedingly grieved even to death Stay here and watch with me. Was Joel, uh, Joel, Job extremely grieved? Yes. And going forward, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I desire, but as you desire. And he came to the taught ones and found them asleep and said to Kepher, So you were not able to watch with me one hour. Watch and pray, lest you enter into trial. The spirit indeed is eager, but the flesh is weak. Yeshua was the one going through the trial. Now, we're seeing Yeshua in perfect repentance, right? He's saying, your will, Father, not mine. He's turned to the Father. He's not, you know, he, he's, there's not an ounce of self in him at this moment. And Yeshua is saying, you guys around me, you need to watch. Lest you be tempted. Lest you be tested. Do we see something similar happen to Job's three friends? Is the question. And I'm going to say as a seed, yes. Because as we're going to start going through the book of Job, we're going to see all of these men's hearts being brought to the surface. You know, these three friends come and comfort Job. Some comfort they bring. To the point where Job actually says, it will probably, your wisdom will be right now as if you shut your mouth. And kept it closed. He actually reproves them back. There's really, it's a really interesting thing. And his three friends actually being self-righteous in all of this. So let's stop here. I hope today's been a blessing. Like I said, today is introductory. Like now that we've set this foundation, I've made some bold statements. We'll read the book. Of, well, we'll get the main bits out of the book of Job and we'll start seeing these statements really come to light and really stand and then once we complete we'll go full circle. Amen.